What's going on guys? My name is Hussein and this is an interesting one. NPM packages being shady and act like a malware. If you really think about it, what is NPM? It stands for Node Package Manager. If you, if you use Node.js, you must have installed at least one Node package in your career as a developer in order to install tools, install libraries, install things that makes your life as a developer easy. And if you really think about it, it's like, can a node package be a malware? Well, it runs code on your machine, so of course it can. However, if, if we really sit down and think about the, the, the coverage of what an NPM package can do, it is absolutely scary because, because unlike Deno, Node.js doesn't give you uh, uh, privileges or security um, tweaks to, to configure your application. It just, it's a free for all. Whatever you run your Node.js application, the packages have the same privileges as your Node.js application, right? And Presumably, if you're running an individual studio code, it's just these permissions are inherited to your Node.js platform. And as a result, your Node packages. So what happened here is someone decided to brand jack. This is a new term I never heard about. But uh, to brand jack Twilio, which is a very famous API uh, library, into a Node package. So they call it Twilio-NPM, which is couldn't get any shadier than that, right? So the actual node package name is, the, the Twilio node package is called Twilio, right? But this person created a new node package that's called Twilio-NPM. The moment he published it or she published it, it got a lot of, a lot of downloads. But what does it do? So this uh, Sonatype, this, this company that is uh, apparently they are experts in security research they found that i'm not surprised they found it so fast right so apparently they're they're, they're searching the new the npm package registry all the time or maybe they are co coordinating or cooperating with the npm security team for to scan the registry for bad actors like this so what does what does this do let's jump into it guys so there are three versions for this this one, right? The first version, the first version of Twilio NPM, version 100. And uh, for the people listening on the podcast, we're looking at the package.json file that have the script tag. And if you know, the script tag is the first thing that get, uh, that get executed it really depends on, on the command that you execute on npm run. So if you do npm run and then you specify like space test, then that the test script will be executed, right? But there are built in stuff that get executed regardless, like post install or pre install. What do you want me to do after I install the package? So there are things that run automatically and this is what they do. In their post install script tag, they had in the first version, nothing's too fancy. They're doing a curl, HTTP, and some blah, 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 random uh, string dot ingrok dot IO. And I talked about ingrok, guys, and what it is exactly. Check out the video right here. Ingrok is, is basically a remote, uh, uh, as a remote port forwarding platform that allows you to spin up a server locally and what it does it opens as a port remotely on a public machine and then forwards anything on that remote public port that you created to your internal and it does that usually usually through ssh but it doesn't have to so angular is just one implementation of this, right? It's, it's just a free thing that you can put. But if you have an, a public SSH server, you can do exactly that. And I talked about SSH remote port forwarding and local port forwarding. Check out the videos if you want to understand how exactly that works. Okay. So, but, but we'll get to that. So what they're doing here in the first version is harmless. 
we're looking at curl. They're curling the HTTPS site. So that will establish a TCP connection to first it's going to do a DNS on blah, 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 dot ingrok dot IO, get the DNS, get the IP address, establish a TCP connection, establish a TLS connection, right? Curl does all of that. Daniel Stamberg does all of that for us. Okay. And, and after that is going to do a get command and fetch the content of that page. Apparently, the Sona type security team found that it does it was harmless, and maybe they published it so it is harmless as a first version, and then they follow it up with with two versions that are extremely dangerous. So let's 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 jump into it. Let's let's continue. So we're looking at the second version, one o two of Twilio dash npm, which is the malware. I hate the word malware. I don't know. I found it sounds like very markety, right? It's just an app that does bad things, right? It, te technically, what is a bad thing, right? This is just establishing a TCP connection. So you can argue that anything can be interpreted as a bad or, or good, right? It's just, it's just a very philosophical question. So again, out of the scope of this video, but I just want to really understand and squeeze this terms, right? We just invent new terms for no particular reason, malware. All right, maybe undesired behavior. So we're looking at the 0102 version post and install script. Here's what it does. It does a sinister task. Let's zoom in so you guys see. And for the people in the podcast, we're we're reading the post install script package.json and it says bash space dash i, which is interactive, and then da slash div slash tcp slash an address for dot tcp dot ingrok dot io slash port. <laughs> so, what does that do? What does that do, guys? This, this is a public, uh, presence for the tcp.ingrok.io tells me the fact that there is a TCP in that domain tells me that this is a, a TCP uh, a TCP port forwarding right so it's a it's it's a TCP tunnel right there is another idea where you can do an HTTP tunnel in ingrok but this is a layer four stuff that means that means just allow me to send anything in this in this pipe, right? And instead of just having it specific to HTTP, right? And this is the port, 11425. So what the client is doing here, the moment you install twilio.mpm or update it to the latest version, post install is going to execute, it's going to do a bash, and it's going to establish a TCP connection to the to that domain, right? First, it's going to do a DNS, get the IP address, and then it's going to establish a TCP connection to that port, right? Obviously, that port is open on that remote server, and and anything going from my internal machine, even if I was behind a NAT and router, that will allow the connection because we usually, if I was don't stop outgoing connection, it stops incoming connection. Okay, that's how firewall was designed. You can block that by default if you would like to, but it's going to cause havoc if you don't know what you're doing. Okay, so what it's doing here is establishing a TCP connection. And this is referred to as a fancy term. TCP reverse shell, right? And uh, I, love, I love how people just throw in new terms every day, right? So... Let, let's let's unpack that, right? Maybe it's known in the security world as TCP reverse shell. Oh, this is a reverse shell, right? But to me, a reverse connection is is the first principle of this, right? So we're doing a reverse connection. So we say, Hussein, what is a reverse connection, right? I know a connection. A connection is I am a client and you are a server and I want to connect to you, right? So I establish the TCP connection. I send the send packet to you, right? And you better have that port open to, to which I'm sending the send packet to in order for you to respond, right? And bet, you better, all the firewalls allow me to do that, right? Even the firewall at your end, okay? So that's, that's a connection. A reverse connection is, is when, when the intent is 
the, the, a, an outsider want to establish a connection, not really a connection, want to, to establish a connection to the internal, to me as an internal behind firewalls and, and, and NAT devices, right? Someone want to establish connection to me, okay? But you can't obviously throw a connection, right? Because you have to listen to a port locally and then somehow manage the NAT. It's impossible, right? You have to do port forwarding. So nobody is going to allow anything to, to the client that you want to establish connection to. So what you do is a reverse connection, okay? A reverse connection is nothing but a connection, right? It's just a fancy term that people invent to confuse everybody. That's what that's the that's the reality out there in networking. <laughs> everybody wants to be confused. So what we do is reverse the roles. Let the client establish a connection to an outside server. And that's exactly what we did. So it's technically the client doesn't know that it's establishing a connection. We only establish a connection from the client to an outside server. So we reverse the role so that we have access to the client. So the, the goal here is not the connection itself. The goal here is I want to establish a tunnel between an outside world, the, i.e. the attacker, and the victim, which is the, ser which is, which is the client. It's not, it happens to be the client, but the victim is the user here, right? And the victim, funny enough, is the one who's establishing the connection to begin with. So it is technically a reverse connection, I still find it a little bit confusing if you think about it. To me, the whole thing is just pure client-server architecture. Who's the client and who's the server? The client is the victim in this case, and the server is the attacker, right? And if you look at it differently, it sometimes it confuse you, but this is what happened. So what is happening here is the moment you do an NPM install, that triggers the, the the victim let's call them the victim I keep saying the client right the victim initiates a request a tcp connection to an attacker server and just like that you came to the attacker does that make sense you as a victim you actually went to the attacker it's not the, the other way around the attacker is just sitting there they cannot come to you if if you flip it where the victim actually initiates the connection to the attacker, that's all good. That's called the reverse connection, right? I still, um, I think just explaining reverse connection is very confusing to me. I like to explain it just as a normal connection. And, and just adding TCP reversal is just confuse everything to me, right? Again, guys, this is my personal opinion. Everybody's allowed to have opinions and anything, right? And that, that's why I always find these terms a little bit confusing, but that could be me. So, so this is establishing a connection to, a, a, to the attacker server, which is 4.tcp.ingrok.io11425. And when, once you do that, the attacker now is aware of you because, oh, the moment we get a connection, oh, someone just bite, someone just bit. What is the past tense of bite? Bitten? Bite? Bit? I guess bit. Someone just bit. So what do you do is basically you send, start sending commands to, to kind of control this. And since you're in bash, which, which we did bash died I, which is interactive, you can essentially execute command elevated to whomever executed the bash, i.e. the Node.js app, i.e. the Visual Studio code, if you're running this in Visual Studio. That's absolutely dangerous. Okay, so that's how they, they, they say in here in Sona types, hey, Ingrok use case is in this case becomes more clear to get a reverse shell on the victim's machine without worrying about NAT and firewall. And the reason without worrying about NAT and firewall is we're not going to let the attacker connect to the local machine because it's almost impossible with NATs and firewall, right? NAT, we talked about NAT, guys. Check out the video right here. It's, it's impossible to connect from the outside to the inside. It's a private IP address. You have a private IP address. So what you do is uh, the, you reverse the roles, right? So you let the, you let the victim connect to outside war and, and nothing is stopping the, the firewall. Trust anything, any traffic coming from the inside out. It doesn't trust uh, traffic normally coming from the outside in. 
okay? This is called brand jacking attack. Brand jacking is using a brand like Twilio, which is huge, and jack, <laughs> and then hijack, I guess, the, the, the attack, uh, the, the victims by creating a fake brand, right? And, and uh, tricking people to download it. And, and the tricky thing about NPM is just the moment you install it, it just runs, which is extremely uh, dangerous. I don't think NPM warns you or anything like that. It says, hey, by the way, there's something about to execute. Nope. It does not. So Deno is, is coming as, as another framework, I guess, runtime. Let's call it the runtime, no framework. People don't like the word framework for some reason. People keep yelling at me when I use the word framework for Node.js. So, or React. <laughs> so, so I apologize. So, um, what we're we talking about? We're talking about Deno. So Deno has this idea of, of only allow certain execution, especially dash dash network. When you essentially want to run something with networking privilege, you are responsible to actually tell it to run with networking uh, privileges. And I believe the latest version of Deno, I'm probably mistaken, maybe I read some this somewhere else. You can specify which domains you can connect to through Demo, Deno. It's like, yeah, Deno is supposed to connect only to this public uh, IP address or this particular IP address or this particular domain, right? So if someone inserts like a shady Ingrilk domain, it's going to be blocked, right? So you have to explicitly set that. Yeah, this creates a little bit of friction for the developer, but I guess it will, it will, it will increase the security, let's say, right? But yeah, a lot of people, essentially what they do uh, is code in a virtual machine. I, I've seen this pattern evolving now where people spin up a docker container and and they visual studio code it inside the container and start coding there so they are completely isolated not even a vm inside a container i've seen that I was like woo uh when we did the homomorphic encryption episode with uh, the ibm uh the ibm homomorphic encryption they spun up a docker container image for us they have a docker image we downloaded and we spin up a container which had a visual studio code with their with their c plus plus code repository everything is isolated nicely so even if and such attacks like this happen no one cares because what are you gonna get what are you gonna what are you gonna steal in my docker container there is nothing right so literally there is nothing except my code i mean yeah, if you care about your code. I mean, if it's open source, you don't care. But if it, if it is like, uh, yeah, they, they don't, the attacker doesn't have access to that. All right, guys. It's an interesting uh, article. I'm going to leave it below for you to read. But uh, what do you guys think about these uh, interesting attacks? Right? Be careful out there. Don't just install any NPM package without actually looking at it. Right? Otherwise, if you want to just test, make sure to be in a VM or something you don't care about. Otherwise, uh, an attacker can actually access you, even if you're behind net. Fortunately, this is this is the world we live in now. All right, guys, I'm going to leave you in the uh, with this. Uh, going to see you in the next one. Make sure to subscribe for more coverage, security coverage, software engineering coverage, news. I talk about back in engineering mainly, but I, I, I spread my wings everywhere. And uh, please, whenever you see articles like this, send it my way. There's my Twitter right there uh, for the people in the podcast. It's H-N-A-S-R. Make sure to follow. Uh, suggest me any, any article that is interesting. I'll make sure to cover it if, if, it's, if it's interesting enough like this one. And I'm going to see you in the next one. You guys stay awesome. Goodbye.